This is our third week uh, from Revelation. Next week, we're starting a new series uh, called The Fruit of Faith that we'll do through the rest of May. Um, but I hope that we will continue talking about some of this stuff from Revelation. It's incredibly interesting, and I hope that it'll be stuff that, that we can continue to learn from. Here's what we have on tap today. Super simple theology is this. Jesus is worthy of all honor and praise. Jesus is worthy of all honor and all praise. Our application today is this. Our lives present and eternal are about proclaiming the worth and glory of our Savior. And our prayer today is, God, help us to rightly give you the honor and glory to your name. When we talk about Jesus being worthy of all honor and praise, I think that that's a pretty simple statement for most of us. Uh, if somebody were to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is worthy of all honor and praise? I think that most Christians would say, yes, I believe that. I believe that Christ is worthy of all honor and praise. And yet there seems to be a disconnect uh, between what we say and how we act. A lot of times uh, we live for our own pleasure, for our own glory, for our own honor. And we are most offended, deeply offended when those things don't come to us that we believe should come to us. And so uh, from a theological side, we say, yes, Jesus is worthy of all honor and praise. And from a practical side, we kind of feel like we are. Uh, and so we tend to live our lives that way a lot. In fact, our conversation about heaven, uh, which I think is a conversation we need to continue as well, but our conversation about heaven, so when I say heaven, I'm typically meaning the new Jerusalem, Revelation 21, the heavens and earth being made new, and the city of God coming down on earth and dwelling here and all that, I like the finished version of the story, like not, not the temporary or in-between kind of thing, but the completion of the story. Like when we tend to think about heaven, we tend to at least, let me say this differently, the churches that I grew up in and the impression that I had as a child growing up in church was that heaven was about me. And here's what I mean by that. Whenever people would talk about heaven, they would talk about, man, I can't wait to see what kind of mansion I get. Man, I can't wait to see the kind of things I'm going to do in heaven. I think I told you that my mansion was going to have a really big slide from the top story all the way to down to the bottom story. It was going to be a spiral slide. Those were going to be a lot more fun. Uh, I, I guess I just assumed that that would always be a dream of mine. I don't know. When I was a kid, I was like, man, that's what heaven's going to be like. And then uh, walking on the streets of gold and next to crystal seas, which are probably um, could be literal, could be figurative, we don't know, but uh, we have this idea, and I told you that, that what I used to hear, I think I said it here, but maybe I didn't, I know I said it on Wednesday nights, I had a, a friend who used to say stuff like, man, I just can't wait until I can get to heaven and have my mom's buttermilk biscuits again, so apparently his, his mom is baking in heaven, um, uh, but I, I don't know, like everybody else gets whatever they want, but she's still in the kitchen, I, I don't know, uh, <laughs> If the, you know, my version of heaven is my mom in the kitchen, but her version of heaven is, I, I don't know. Like, so my, my point being that typically when we think about heaven, we think about how it's going to feel to us and how we're going to experience it and how it's going to be a blessing to us. And I want to be really, really clear. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God for anyone who comes to him must first of all, believe that he exists. And second of all, that he rewards those who diligently seek him. So I, I want to be really clear. There is great reward in following God. Okay, and, and we do follow God with reward in mind. We do follow God with this idea that we will be blessed for having followed him, that we will be uh, richly rewarded for having followed him. I just think that typically what we define as the reward is way short of what the reward actually is. Typically, we define the reward as the mansion and the buttermilk biscuits. And I just think, wow, that's really lousy. <laughs> You know, like we, we, we come to God for the sake of God, for knowing God that the, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 1, and I, I don't know what this means in its fullness. I have some ideas, some thoughts about it if you want to talk about it Wednesday night. But Ephesians 1, speaking of those who have put faith in God, say that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And, and I just want you to know that as believers, like there is reward in God, there is blessing in God, but I think that the reward and blessing is found in God, and if you will, not the buttermilk biscuits or the size of your mansion. Okay? Revelation chapter 5 says this. I'm going to begin in verse 6. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. That's an interesting thing that we can talk about Wednesday that I don't have a lot of answers for, but it's also referenced in the Old Testament. 
Uh, and he went and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. So this is clearly a reference to Christ, the lamb that looks like it's been slain, clearly a reference to Christ. The 24 elders fell down uh, before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. If this right here does not constitute a large percentage of our view of eternity, then we're missing something. This worship of, of Christ, in, in the previous chapter there is the uh, specific worship of God the Father. In this chapter, the specific worship of Christ the Son. If, if, a, if a large part of our eternal perspective isn't standing in the presence of God, God Almighty, the Savior of mankind, and delighting in Him and enjoying Him, then we, it, it, I'll say it this way. If buttermilk biscuits, you, you know, maybe you have dietary restrictions, carry more weight for you than the presence of of the Savior of mankind, then we've got to switch our view because something is terribly imbalanced. This is going to be a very obvious statement. It shouldn't even have to be said. But when we think on heaven, we should desire Christ more than the, the bread that we can't eat today, you know? Amen. Right? Christ is the bread of life, not to, put too, not, not to put it to point, you know, find a point on it, but like Christ is the bread of life in him, there is satisfaction that, that surpasses all our cravings. The Bible says in, in Psalm 1611 that in the presence of God is fullness of joys and in his right hand pleasures everlasting. We, we, we find joy in this earth and, and I have no problem with that. I have great joy in my wife. I have great joy in my kids. I, I enjoy my work. Um, I enjoy myself sometimes, uh, you know, but like, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, like we, we have these, we have these moments, we have these things that, that give us pleasure, that give us delight. Micah's four and a half pound bass, uh, you know, the, um, the eight pound bass or whatever that you didn't weigh that time because Stephen didn't have a scale in his boat and it's Stephen's fault that we don't know how big that monster bass was, you know, uh, 12 pound bass. Good. Yeah. If we don't know it was 12. <laughs> If you're not sure, it was 12, right? That's the rule. So the 12-pound bass, while you're eating buttermilk biscuits dipped in Dr. Pepper, uh, you know, that's Micah's maybe dream. Um, like this idea that, that these things, that these pleasures somehow eclipse God, that, that when we think about heaven, we think of the highest pleasures that we've ever experienced in this earth, and we take those high earthly pleasures and we fold them onto heaven and we say, that's what heaven's going to be like. And I want us to know that that hasn't even scratched the surface. Every now and then I'll, I'll bump into somebody who will say, I, I just don't know that standing in the presence of God, like how is that going to be fun? Like I want to do something. And, and I just want us to know that God is richer by far that when the Bible says that in his presence is fullness of joy. You've never experienced fullness of joy. You've had moments of joy, but even the moments of joy you've had diminish with time. You don't look back on them as fondly as you once did, or, or you forget some of the moments. I, I promise you there is something that delighted you as a three-year-old that you have no memory of today. I promise you. And I promise you that there will be things that delight you this year that by the time you draw your last breath, you won't even remember. And yet the presence of God contains fullness of joy and beholding our king face to face. And, and I, I'm telling you, like, there, there's, there's these images in my head. I have, I have for more than 20 years wanted to create a video series on the glory of God. Uh, it's just kind of rolled around in the back of my brain. And 20 years ago, I approached a guy, a video guy, and we were talking, and we were talking about how we could, this was before drones and all this kind of stuff, you know, like 
Uh, this was like 23 years ago, and we were talking about how we could get this video footage that I wanted and all this stuff. And he was like, man, I guess we could rent a helicopter. And it's like, I can't afford a helicopter. I work at a coffee shop and make 400 bucks a month, you know. And, uh, but like, when we think about the glory of God, when we think about the majesty of God and the beauty of God, there, there are Bible writers who describe it uh, the best that they can. They describe it the best that they can. And, and, and I, think, I think of these guys, I think of these people in the scripture, these men and women who encountered God, and, and as they're describing him, and they say that his face is as bright as the sun, that his eyes are like torches of fire, you know some of my favorite ones, that his voice, when he speaks, twists the cedar trees in half and causes the deer to give birth. That's always my kid's favorite example. That his voice is like many thunderings or like the sound of trumpets or like the sound of an army raising its cry in battle. That when he sat down on the mountain to meet with Moses, the entire mountain was covered in smoke and as though burning with fire. And that uh, the whole place shook and trembled at his presence. Ezekiel says he was surrounded by rainbows. We just sang about that, that he was surrounded as if by rainbows, that from the waist down he looked like uh, fire and from the waist up like metal heated hot with fire, like glowing metal. There's these pictures of God in Isaiah chapter 40 that, that says his hand measures off the entire universe, that the, the hollow part of his hand holds all the waters of the heavens. There, there's this picture of God in Job 38 we've talked about before, where he hunts the food for the lions, where he feeds the, the, the mouth of the ravens, the little ravens peeping in their nest or crying out to God, that the, the lightning stands in the presence of God and asks where it should go, that God has walked the recesses of the deep, that he counts all the stars, that he knows each one by name, that not a hair, this is from Matthew, not a hair of our head falls to the ground apart from him knowing it, that he knows all the numbers of the hairs on our head, he knows all the sparrows, and, and this beauty of God, this glory of God, the Bible says of Jesus that Jesus is the, the perfect, perfect imprint of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And Jesus walked on the earth and he touched the, the eyes of someone born blind and they're opened and he, he takes the crippled man and he makes him to walk and he takes the dead man or the dead 12-year-old girl and causes them to come to life and he multiplies bread and he dies on a cross and his blood was shed for us and he enters into grave and he overthrows the power of sin and he overthrows the power of death and comes forth in glory and ascends into heaven. And I'm just going to tell you something, none of that is boring. And you will stand before the living God, and what your mind cannot fathom now, you will fathom then. And you will see him, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and also 1 John chapter 3. You will know him fully as you are fully known. That's 1 Corinthians 13. And then you will see him as he truly is. That's 1 John chapter 3. You will see him as he truly is. You will behold God in his fullness, and you will not be bored on quite the contrary, you will be fully satisfied. And if our eternal perspective does not have God at its core, I'm not going to say that we're not believers, but I'm going to say that something is definitely wrong in our perspective. And that we've bought into too much of the worldly pleasure, too much of the worldly joy, too much of the, the temporary Temporary cannot comprehend eternal. Temporary can't even begin to fathom eternal. God is richer and better by far. Listen, I am following God because I believe, one, that he exists, and two, I believe that there is reward in following him. I just don't believe that the reward is a big house with fresh-baked bread. I'm not going to say that we don't have a big house with fresh-baked bread baked bread, but like really, there's no night anymore, and you're not sleeping. I mean, you're not having like dinner parties or anything. Like, what do you need a house for? I don't know. Like, time doesn't even exist. We talked about that philosophically on Wednesday night. It's kind of fun. There's no such thing as time, and you want to know something really quirky that I like to think about? If there's no time, there's also no distance, because we only measure distance in time. If you've never considered that, something is near or far only based on the amount of time it takes you to get there. So there's no distance. I don't know. Does that mean that we can just teleport ourselves anywhere we want to go? I have no idea. But I'm telling you, it's way better than you think. 
Everybody has this argument about, you know, what's the best superpower to be able to fly or be invisible. I think it's the third one. I think it's teleportation. Way better. <laughs> and there's no time and there's no distance in heaven, so maybe we're teleporting. I don't know, right? But it's better than you think. God is richer than you think. There is more joy in God. The, you and I can't even fathom what it's like to, to be people who's, who have had sin completely removed from us. The, the power of sin has been broken. We are no longer slaves to sin, but let's just all admit that we feel it hanging out in the side. You know, it's in the side alleys of our hearts waiting to jump us, right? Like, I, I, I have to daily fight to, to not live in insecurity and fear, Right? And I won't have that fight anymore when I'm standing before the Father, when I'm standing before the Son. And I want you to look at these things. Look at what these people say. There's three kind of different things. Uh, There's three different proclamations of the Son. So the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the four living creatures, by the way, are a reference to uh, Ezekiel. And and these four living creatures each have four faces. Um, The face of an ox, the face of of an, uh, an eagle, the face of a man, and the face of a lion. And that's just kind of fun already. And, and, and they, they don't turn. They just, like, whichever way they're going, that's where the face is facing, you know, like just depending. And, and then they have wheels next to them. I have no idea what this exactly looks like, but wheels that are covered in eyes. That's strange. It, it's the reason that Ezekiel almost didn't make it into the Bible. Did you know that? That in 90 AD at the Council of Gemnia, when the Christians were meeting to discuss whether the Old Testament was going to be the Christian scriptures as well, they were kind of freaked out by Ezekiel chapter 1. And because of that, they almost didn't put it in the Bible. They're like, what is this happening here? I don't know. Like the, the, the Christians in 90 AD, if you're bothered a little bit by Ezekiel 1, you're in great company. There were a group of Christians in 90 AD that were going, I think that the scripture of the Old Testament is the scripture that reveals our God. But this Ezekiel 1 thing, that's weird. And they talked about it and decided, you know what? Okay, guys with four faces and wheels covered in eyes, we're in. You know? <laughs> and wherever, the, wherever these four living creatures go, they, they've got wings. They've each got two wings. And the two wings of the, of the guy touches the two wings of the other guy. So they're like a, a square, a cube of four-faced things with these wings touching. And they've each got like a pet wheel covered in eyes. And when they go up, the wheels go up. And when they go sideways, the wheels go sideways. And I, what in the world? Sorry, the four living creatures have four wings. Cherubim have two. Seraphim have six. Angels have none. We can talk about that Wednesday. But anyway, like, this is interesting. And the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and we're not told exactly who those are, all of these are worshiping God. And here's what they say. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Bad stuff's about to happen. For you were slain, and listen to this, by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation, and you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Let me just pause here and say this. We're going to see another reference to this in chapter 7, that people were standing before God, that they were worshiping Christ from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. The blood of Christ was was spilled for every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And let me just make a side note here. As a believer, you don't get to have any racial division with anybody else. None. You don't get to be racially divided, okay? Because Christ has redeemed for God people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. I don't feel like that's something we're bumping into here in this Community, but it is something that is being bumped into in churches around the world. Did you know that? that there are places where people go, well, this salvation's for us, for people like us, for people like... And, and I want you to know that Christ is for everybody. And they are worshiping him here because his blood was spilled and he ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. And he made them into a kingdom and priest for him. It's a beautiful picture. It's referenced all the way back in Deuteronomy. This idea of being a kingdom of priests referenced all the way back in Deuteronomy. It's also referenced in in 1 Peter. Uh, This isn't uh, unique to Revelation. We can talk more about that another time. We don't have time today. Listen, the Bible's really good. I'm just going to recommend it to you. Uh, 3.25 chapters a day is all you have to read to get through the entire thing in a year. It works out to be 23 chapters a week. And you've read the entire thing in a year. 
Um, if that's a little bit too much for you, then, you know, like read two chapters uh, a week and you'll get through it in a, uh, not quite a year and a half. It's good. And the more you read it and the more you see it and, and you like to be able to come to a place like this and go, man, kingdom of priests, I've heard that before. Yeah, you've heard it before because it's in the Bible. It's all over the place. So they're worshiping God because by the, or they're worshiping Christ because by his blood he has redeemed people for God from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And then look at this. It says, Then I looked and I heard the, around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands upon thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So now these, these myriad upon myriad of angelic hosts, okay, these angelic hosts are declaring of Christ, worthy is the lamb who is slain, we just saying that, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. One of my favorite verses, maybe my favorite verse of all, 1 Timothy 1.17, unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be all glory and all honor and all power forever and ever, and I'll add, and ever and ever and ever. And ever and ever. Amen. Let all glory be given to God. This, this idea here, this is kind of an interesting thing because these angelic uh, hosts begin to proclaim the worth of God. But in Isaiah 6, we're introduced to seraphim. Seraphim have six wings, and with two they cover their face, with two they cover their feet, and with two they're flying, and they're in the presence of God. And in Isaiah 6, we find out that the seraphim never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. I just want us to get that. It makes it really interesting when you read Isaiah 6 that the seraphim, for as long as they have existed, have never ceased to proclaim the worth of God. And it makes it really interesting when you read in Revelation that there was 30 minutes of silence in heaven as all things are being brought to a conclusion. So uh, these seraphim who have never ceased to declare holy, holy, holy. I mean, like, think about it. it there, there never ceases to be this proclamation of the worth of God. And then there's 30, second, or 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Another story, another time. It's really interesting. The Bible is good. Have you, have you ever heard of it? It's, uh, you, you should try it. Um, it there, Micah listens. Uh, if you want to know, like, um, you listen to, like, uh, uh, a dramatized version, right? So like you can hear the sheep and stuff in the backgrounds and like whenever there's an offering, the sheep cry. No, I'm just kidding. It's not quite that dramatic. Uh, it is. It's pretty dramatic. So yeah, so Stephen and, and Micah listen to that version. Like if you need something to listen to on your commute or whatever, like uh, we don't think that you actually have to read it. Um, you just just know it. Just be in it. Just l learn about God, right? And so like there are plenty of people around the world who, who can't read and whatever. So Micah's not one of those. Uh, he, just, <laughs> he, he just listens, you know. Um, I, I like paper. I just like paper. Um, I, I, like, I like the feel of it. I like the sound of it. I, I like the feel of my pen on it. So I really, really want to buy. Have you seen these journals that are made out of rocks? Anybody seen those yet? Seriously? Oh, dude, I want one so badly. It's a journal, but it's like 30 bucks. And it is paper made out of rock. And it, is, it, it's, uh, it takes a lot less effort. Uh, there's a lot less pollution. A lot less, Anyway, it's really cool. And apparently it's the smoothest writing that you'll ever have. And you can spill your coffee on it. And because it's made out of rock, it doesn't ruin the paper. And it's, it's amazing. I really want one, but it's 30 bucks, you know. And it's just like, it's just paper. But it's made out of rock. <laughs> I'm also just thinking, like, that's going to make your, like, backpack a little heavier. I don't know. But if you ever get attacked, like you have a just, anyway, I'm just thinking, I'm sorry, I got distracted by, I'll have to find it and show you, I'll show you Wednesday, we'll, look, we'll watch the video about it, and now y'all are like, I'm not coming Wednesday, <laughs> I won't make you watch the video, I'll just have it queued up for those who want to see it, I promise tomorrow at staff meeting I'm going to be showing Mike and Pierce, I can't believe I haven't shown you all this, this journal. Listen to this. This is, the, this is the third thing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne, to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. I want to I 
highlight a couple of things for you. I just referenced the seraphim who never stopped crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And in that same text, okay, in that same text, the, the seraphim, when they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, they, they make an interesting statement. They say the whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. I, I want to say this to you, and I, I want this to be a thought that maybe carries some weight with you as you leave this place today. The entire earth is filled with the glory of God. But there's another interesting verse that uses similar language in Habakkuk 2.14. Okay? And in Habakkuk 2.14, it says this, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Now, if you're not careful, the way you'll hear that is Isaiah 6, 3 says, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And if you're not careful, the way you'll hear it is Habakkuk 2, 14 says, the earth will be filled with the glory of God. But that's not what it says. Isaiah 6, 3 says, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And Habakkuk 2, 14 says, the whole earth will, will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Here's the point that I want you to understand. Right now, as it presently happens, the entire universe, every created thing is filled with the glory of God. We just don't see it yet. But there will come a day when everybody sees the fullness of God's glory. Okay? There will come a day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. I'm referencing now, of course, Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2, speaking of Christ, it says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing and took on the form and the likeness of a human, of a man, as a servant, and became obedient to death, yes, even death on the cross, so that God exalted him and gave him a name that is above every Every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus is Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And what do we just read here in Revelation? To him, uh, sorry, I got to back up. Um, here it is, verse 13. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. What Philippians 2 promises we see in Revelation 5, that the glory of God that has filled the earth has now been revealed to the earth and the knowledge of God's glory has been made, ma made manifest so that there is a worship with every knee and every tongue those who deny Christ will still recognize him as God. There will come a day that they see him. There will come a day that everybody, everybody will know that Christ is God and King. In Romans uh, chapter 14, 11, it say, says a similar thing that, that in the in the last days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that we will, we will all bend the knee before God. I don't know why that should be so offensive to us. That we would bow the knee to Christ, that we would bow the knee to the Father. I don't know why that should be so hard for us. I, I suppose... Uh, this is something I've thought for a long time. I don't know that I can say it 100%, so give me a little bit of grace with it. But I think at the core of every sin is pride. Um, and I think there's something in us that, that really wants heaven to be about us. We want the whole world and our life and our, like, what is my purpose here? What is my legacy? What is my mark on this earth? How am I going to leave my name? Like, that's typically how we think. Your legacy, believer, your legacy is the legacy of Christ. Your purpose is the glorification of Christ. The name that you leave behind, more important than your own, is the name of Jesus. This is what we're here for created for the glory of God, for the purpose of God, that we can magnify him here in, the, in our stay upon this earth and then one day see him face to face and, and delight in him and, and feel the fullness of pleasure in his presence and also give him perfectly the glory because now we see him as he truly is. Here's an interesting text, uh, very similar to the text from Philippians 2 and Revelation 
um, 5 and also Romans 14. I, I won't read you the whole chapter, but this is Isaiah 45, and I'm just going to, he's kind of rebuking his people and reminding them who he is. In Isaiah 45, 5, he says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Uh, besides me, there is no God. He says again in verse 6, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. He says again in verse um, 18, I am the Lord and there is no other. I do not speak in secret. And then he says again in uh, 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that will not return to me. Every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I am God and there is no other God. I am the one who exercises righteousness and pours out righteousness and every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And instead of that being something that we look for as, as like a as God strong arming us into this position of humility, what it ought to be is an understanding that the reason that this happens is because we are so delighted with who he is. We're so in love with who he is. In, in the Gospels, and I'm going to lie to you about which chapter it is, it's, it's something. It's, it's Mark 5 or Mark 10, but I feel like Mark 5, but don't hold me to that. Anyway, uh, it's in a couple of places, so maybe it's 10 in one place and 5 in another. But Bartimaeus, this guy who was born blind, he's sitting on the side of the road. where We don't know that he was born blind because he actually says, I want to regain my sight, which could mean that he had been seeing before, but we don't. Okay, anyway, he's on the side of the road, blind. Jesus is coming by. He hears the noise. He's asking, what's going on? And they say, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He, hearing this, I told you this is one of my favorite stories as well. He, hearing this, gets up and he's, he calls out to Jesus. He can't see where Jesus is. And he calls out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in my head, I, I always think he's facing the wrong way. Um, he's probably not. But it's a big crowd passing by, you know. Like Jesus is over here and he just hears the crowd. And he's like, Jesus, have mercy on me. And I always imagine his buddy like turning him gently, you know. And, and, then, and then he keeps calling, and Jesus stops, and there's a guy next to him who says, be quiet. And the Bible is hilarious. If you're not finding the Bible funny, come and read it with me. Um, I'll do the voices. You know, I'll give you the Ryan version of it. But there's a guy, literally, this is in the text. There's a guy next to him who tells Bartimaeus to be quiet, and the Bible says Bartimaeus got even louder. That's totally something Micah would have done. I, I would have been like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm stupid. And Micah would have been like, so like, pretend that blind Bartimaeus is like blind Micah. And in my head, Bart, that's what I call him, his buddies, he allows his buddies to call him Bart. In my head, Bart, when the guy says, be quiet, Bart goes, like he's blind, he can't see. I closed my eyes to symbolize that I was blind, but like he, like he kind of gives him a look, you know? And then he starts calling all the louder, the Bible says. And Jesus brings him to him and he says, come to me, bring him to me. And he throws down his coat and he goes to Jesus. And I don't know what that was like, <laughs> you know? But he goes to Jesus and he gets there and he says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want to regain my sight. And he says, your faith has healed you and he can see. And the Bible says that Bartimaeus follows behind Jesus, dancing and leaping for joy, proclaiming the goodness of God. And I just want you to know that when the Bible says every tongue will confess and every knee will bow, it comes from that heart, that heart, and not a heart of being oppressed. It comes from the heart of this is the one who has loved me. This is the one who has saved me. This is the one who has redeemed me. This is the one who, when I was an enemy, called me a friend. This is the one who, when I was a stranger, called me a child of God. This is the one who, and, and, and our worship of God doesn't come from a place of oppression, but comes from a place of mercy and love, and it's a delight, and it's a joy, and if that isn't part of our eternal perspective, then we're missing it. That brings us to our application probably 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I really do have notes. <laughs> Sometimes I get excited. Our application is this, our lives present and eternal. I thought that sounded smart, you know, <laughs> are about proclaiming the worth and glory of our Savior. Our lives present and eternal are about proclaiming the worth of our God and Savior. 
don't think of that as a small thing. Don't think of spending your life for the honor and glory of Jesus as a small thing. It's the biggest thing you can do. Look, be wise, you know, have a life insurance policy, right? You know, invest, you know, talk to Micah about cryptocurrency, whatever. He's a lot smarter on that kind of stuff than I am. Like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like, you know, do life. But do life with the aim and the intention of glorifying God in it. The, the things that you're skilled at, the things that you desire, the things that you're able to do, uh, the family that you have, the children that you're raising, the, this person you're married to, the, the relationship you're involved in because you're dating or whatever, do it for the glory of God. A really easy verse just to tack on here at the end would be 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says whether you eat and drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. But that really requires a lot more explanation, so I'm not going to use that verse today. But see, I kind of (laughs) did. But I pretended like I didn't. So that you can't say later he used that verse out of context. I'll be like, no, 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 I just mentioned the verse. I wasn't going to use it. Do everything for the glory of God. I want to end with this text. I I, I just, Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. The people have been sinning. Moses breaks the tablets. The Levites then put swords on their hip and go through the camp. And the Bible says they killed about 3,000 of their brethren that day. In Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes, about 3,000 are saved that day. And if you miss that parallel, you have missed something super cool. Because on the day the law is given, 3,000 die. On the day the Spirit is given, 3,000 are saved. It is a super powerful, poignant point that the works of the law bring death, but the Spirit of God brings life. It's super significant. And a really great place for that to be explained to us is in Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain, the mountain where the law was given. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, a physical mountain, blazing in fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. Because remember, God had stepped down on it. And the sound of the trumpet and a voice, the voice of God, whose words made the hearers beg that they wouldn't hear any further messages from him. They couldn't endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses himself said, I tremble with fear. So... You didn't come to that mountain. You didn't come to the mountain of fear. You didn't come to the mountain that if you touch it, you're going to die. You didn't come to the mountain of law. Listen to this. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gatherings and party. You know, they're partying. To the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And you have come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood of Christ that speaks better than the words of the blood of Abel. Here's this contrast. You haven't come to that which could be physically touched and would also produce death. You have come to that which is a spiritual place which brings life. And because of that, we say, God, you are worthy. Christ, you are worthy of all worship, of all honor, of all praise, of all glory. And I will spend my life making it my aim to delight in your exaltation. In this life and in the next declaring that Jesus is worthy of all honor and all glory. And that brings us to our prayer today. God, help us to rightly give you honor and glory Do your name. Help us to rightly give you the honor and glory Do your name. Would you take just a moment and just pray that? Pray that God would help you to give honor and glory to his name right now and your stay upon this earth and your time upon this earth and your work and your family and your endeavors and your pursuits and your pleasures, that right now you would give honor and glory to his name.
God, I do ask that our lives would be spent for your glory, for your honor, for your exaltation. God, that we would make much of the name of Jesus in our stay upon this earth, that we would exalt the name of Christ, that we would elevate your name, oh God, that our, our, our hope would be set on you, that our affection would be set on you, that our love would be set on you, and that you would be the desire of our souls. Would you take just another moment and just ask that God would give you a right perspective of eternity? An eternity that draws you into the worship of a gracious God who has loved you and saved you? That out of the response of love and mercy that he has lavished upon you, it would stir up in you a heart of praise? Take just a moment to ask God for that correct perspective. <laughs>